Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 871. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 23rd, 2024. All right, welcome back to another show of Anglican Unscripted, where this is your happy place, not just the happy place of Kevin and George, where we sit down every week and talk about the news that happens around the world, most of it Anglican, some of it Christian, and every once in a while we delve into politics because it's fun. And boy, we've had a fun two weeks of politics. George, how are you doing? Well, Kevin, your point about politics, the world is just buzzing with that stuff. I went to the, I'm out of uniform today. I went to the foot doctor and I sat around in the waiting room with all the other old farts waiting to get their corns shaved and toenails clipped. And everybody in that room is talking about the same topic. No, not their aches and pains, but is Joe Biden alive? Uh, what's happening in the world? We don't know. No, we have no idea. It, it, that's crazy. Uh, I just had my uh, 40th class reunion this weekend uh, on Friday and Saturday. We went, uh, about uh, half of my graduating class showed up, about 70 people, uh, to a, a, a rented room on top of a bar. And it was a great time. You know why? Nobody talked about politics. We're all from Wisconsin where politics can get a little dicey in this time of election, but we're just a great time to catch up and, you know, on families, friends, and oh, I, I lost contact with you and I lost contact with you. And um, the, the amazing thing about, about my class from Verona, Wisconsin, 1984, is about half of them or three quarters are on Facebook. So, you, you know, you, you, you're pretty much caught up anyway. Our first class reunion that I attended was the 20th, and that was before uh, Facebook. So um, it was just a, a different, interesting time, and I, I had a blast. But nobody yeah. dared talk about <laughs> the orange man or the uh, the old man or uh, her. <laughs> so it was just crazy. Did anybody still have their uh, flock of seagulls hairstyle? No, and, no, no, uh, no. We had pictures from be, be, uh, before, and uh, my picture shows that little uh, dippy de doo off the front of my my bangs, the flock of seagulls haircut. But uh, thankfully, I was not the only old, grade, balding guy at uh, the class reunion. They, most of the most the gym me. teacher came, did he? <laughs> you no, know, it was crazy. And um, I mean, there were, there were a couple guys who remained uh, rail thin and had all their hair. And whatever, fine, you can be that way. But all the real popular guys back in high school, right here, just look like this. Yeah, so oh. uh, I, I fit in well. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Now, before we get too far into the program, it is your desire job as a viewer to click the like button right there a, it looks just like this okay it's on facebook and youtube if you click that you have fooled the algorithm of youtube and facebook they will now think that this is a good show that they should promote if you've not done so please subscribe there's a red rectangle uh, right there you click on that and it will subscribe you you will get instant notifications once you click that bell uh, if you not share this program with f uh, friends and family and foe, please do so. Um, this is, you know, networking is the best part of Anglicanism, and being able to share this program is probably the best way we're going to grow the audience. All right, George, let me go. I'll oh, go to the comment section. Uh, I mean, comments uh, on Anglican scripted are fun to read. We could do just an episode once a month where we read the comments, George, and we could charge for that. It, it, that's what we should do. Uh, Okay, biggest story in all the Anglican world is, number one, Biden is out of the race. Well, nobody saw this coming. Uh, this is the part where we're going to delve into some American politics because the entire world is watching, George. Uh, if you look at the European newspapers, the African papers, the Asian papers, and the American papers, uh, the people are on the edge of their seats since the assassination attempt on uh, former President Trump. And now we've we've disappeared joe biden boom gone yeah i mean i was thinking how can we make this a church story because this has sucked the oxygen out of everything else in american mm -hmm. life literally mm -hmm. everything else there's nothing nothing going on and because the episcopal church the acna the u.s catholic church nobody is talking mm -hmm. about this 
Yeah, because nobody knows what's going on. Sure. Now, uh, Sunday, a little after one o'clock, the news came out on Twitter or X, X, yeah. which in its which in itself is surprising because the Biden administration has been trying to sh- it try to block uh, Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter. It has basically made Twitter the enemy, whereas Facebook and uh, Instagram and TikTok were friendly, and yet they chose Twitter to release the news. Twitter had it 23 minutes before anybody else. And that, I mean, that's crazy. You know? Mm-hmm. So. And in other words, it didn't go to the networks. It didn't go to the newspapers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, so we're in a new world where Twitter now is breaking the news. And Biden put out a letter on private stationery um, where people are challenging, did he actually write this? Um, and then a half hour later, a Twitter message was pointed out saying he backs uh, Kamala Harris to be his successors uh, in the Democratic Party race. Mm-hmm. And that afternoon on the television shows, we started hearing the talking points where the Democratic Party is famous for sending out a memo to its leading influencers who will appear on these TV shows and on their blogs and whatnot and hit the same points. And the, one of the points was that this is very brave of Joe Biden. He, uh, this was an act of strength and courage. And of course, uh, the, the, the counter argument was, you spent the past week, Democrats, trying to get this guy to go. And now he's finally left and you're reversing gears and you're praising him when just last night you were just saying that uh, he's got to go or we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And the churches and the sort of no American sort of religious institution, I'm sure there are, but they basically no, kept the mouth. Yeah. And I mean, nobody knows what was going on. This isn't and, the first time in history that we've had silence from a White House in a time of political crisis. Uh, mm-hmm. You go back in time. But I don't think the White House is obligated to tell us if he's dead. I uh, you know, just I, it, you know it just occurred to me if he's if he's having a Ghostbusters moment, um, there's really no uh, compelling reason the White House has to tell us anything until they're uh, darn tootin' writing. And this is the big problem that we have with Jill Biden. I mean, she's largely, as far as I can tell, in my humble, unpolitical opinion, been running the show for at least the last six months, and. Uh, she, if he's dead, she will let you know when it's your turn to know. So, the, the only member of the family who's spoken out is the is brother, brother Frank. Yeah, and brother Frank said, you know, Joe needs these the for the for remaining time he has left. It should be in peace, which basically sounds like he's on death's door. Yeah. And then the then the White House said, well, then the the word was put out. Well, Frank's a drunk. And he hasn't seen Joe in months. Um, but you're right. Joe Biden has not stepped up, nor has Hunter stepped up. And the America basically is at a, you know, so much is, is pouring through Twitter and other, but basically Twitter is the, or X. I'm still going to call it Twitter because that's well, what it is in my head. Actually, Elon put up a poll uh, a week ago asking if he should change the name back. So, and I said yes because well, I'm sick and tired of calling kind of X. But yeah. Twitter had uh, some reports that uh, Joe Biden was in Las Vegas for a fundraiser last week, and uh, the fundraiser was canceled. And the Las Vegas police told local reporters that. They were ordered by the Secret Service to close down the streets leading to the uh, main hospital in Las Vegas. And then that was changed where Biden was going to be flown back to the uh, East Coast. And the flight took three and a half hours from Las Vegas to uh, Washington, D.C., which is two hours faster than normal. They jetted him back and he's not been seen in public since. And the Las Vegas police have been telling people that they were told that that uh, he had had a uh, a mini stroke, mm-hmm. a temp- TIA, temporary ischemic uh, accident incident, whatever. Yeah, right. And the uh, but 
then the doctor says, well, his blood pressure is fine and his pulse is fine and he's this and that and the other. But then we have uh, other reports saying that he is on hospice care, that he is the morning, the morning Sunday morning news shows were all Biden spokesmen and aides and surrogates were saying he's fighting on. He's not he's not going to let uh, Speaker Pelosi and Barack Obama and the Clintons push him out. He's going to fight because he's won all these millions of votes in the primaries and 14 it's undemocratic. Million. 14 million yeah. votes have been pushed out by 30 Democrats. And this was in the morning and an hour and an hour later. In the afternoon, he's out, yeah. and the talking points arise. And where does the church angle come from? I don't th well, there can't be because there's no facts. All we have is conjecture, allegations, rumors, and more rumors and gossip. Nobody knows anything, and when nobody knows anything, there's only one thing you should be turning to, George, and that would be God. Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> I mean, it, when you don't know what's going on, uh, reduce your anxiety, relieve your anxiety, and, and get in your knees. You, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, in my humble opinion, it works every time. But we are just, we're two pundits right now with no facts, just telling people what we've learned and what we know. And we don't know anything because nobody knows anything because nobody wants us to know anything, George. Well, the Church of England stepped up oh. and took one and took a bullet for George and Kevin. Okay. Because on Monday morning, Bishop Philip North, the Bishop of Burnley, appeared on Thought for the Day, uh -huh. which is on BBC Radio 4. And he gave a, uh, he basically took the Democratic talking points and repeated them about how brave Joe Biden was how courageous this act was. It was an act of generosity. None of which can be shown to be true, but uh, maybe it's because Philip North just listened to the BBC and if the BBC said it, it's, he thought it was right. I don't, yeah. Well, and the thing is the, uh, the Vatican newspaper, Liz Vittorio Romano, put out the same sort of thing based on the democratic talking points. But to me, it's telling telling that the American Catholic bishops didn't put out the, uh, the, the Vatican report, and the Episcopal Church, which is in bed with Joe Biden on almost all his policies. They've kept their mouth shut because yeah. nobody knows what's going on. I'm reminded of this old movie, The Manchurian Candidate, and there's this phrase of with the brainwashed people, Frank Sinatra would say, Raymond Shaw is the kindest, bravest, warmest, most wonderful human being I've ever known in my life. And on Sunday afternoon, you could hear Democratic leaders repeating that, except substitute Joe Biden for Raymond Shaw. Uh, we do have this sense of uh, we're living in a, th in, a, in, a, in a theater and we're watching a performance that we know is a performance and they know that we know it's a performance, but nobody is able to say, just stop, cut it out. Tell us the truth. We know they are lying. They know we know they are lying. We know that they know that we are lying. I mean, um, it was Sosinski's, I can't pronounce his last name, Alexander from Russia said that once. And Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, thank you for the pronunciation. Um, said that, and it, it exists in every generation. It's not something he discovered. Well, he discovered it, but uh, it was not new to uh, communist Russia, uh, Soviet Union at the time. It just, it's human nature is to perpetuate and repeat the lie until people start to agree with it and don't remember what the truth was. Now, I'm not a conspiracy person. George might be a little bit more than me. I'm not in any way, shape, or form. I can, well, but I'm finding myself going, you know, it could be that there's a conspiracy. Uh, clearly, there is a, a, a deep state of some sort that wants to keep control and power, but I don't, I have not wrapped my mind around it because I have better things to do as a Christian than to worry about politics all day long. Um, you know, I, I have to uh, keep myself measured in the word and uh, in fellowship with my fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and I, I can't do that and always be worried 
about what's going on just looking at Facebook and X all day long. And I recommend you guys, you know, try and wean yourself off because uh, what's going to happen is going to happen with or without you. So, you know. well, I know, you're right, Kevin. Politics can overwhelm and overcome people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we, we need to realize these things that these people say do have consequences. Absolutely. Yeah. When Kamala Harris was on the Senate Judiciary Committee, she, uh, you know, told one nominee uh, that President uh, Trump at the time had put forward for uh, judicial office that uh, because he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, he that disqualified him because uh, being part of that Catholic organization meant that he could uh, he didn't support uh, the things that she supported. Yeah. There was a uh, magistrate judge in Washington, D.C., who was a member of the ACNA, uh, who the uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehorse, Sheldon something other, uh, Senator from Rhode Island, Democrat, just attacked him because, well, the ACNA is against uh, gay marriage and this and that. And uh, to go, uh, being a Knights of Columbus, being a good Episcopalian or Anglican, whatever you were, was not a disqualifier for judicial office. But the radical, the progressive wing, uh, that is basically Kamala Harris and company, really does, has seen that. Mm -hmm. And that there is, if, <clears throat> I don't want to say there's a threat, but the, um, we used to, uh, my parish used to go work with an orphanage we have. Yes, we have orphanages in Florida. And when the when the uh, administrations changed and we went to the Biden administration, new rules were handed down by the Biden administration was that you could not go in uh, religious groups could not go into orphanages anymore because of the danger of proselytism that we might share our Christian faith with these orphans. And so the long and the shorter it was, all the uh, outreach programs that were done for you know the local orphanage had to stop unless they were secularized and nobody steps in to fill that void there's no you know there's no alternative uh right. to church support for some yeah. of these things and th but that was just a different regime yeah but i right here camped out in mcfarland wisconsin uh just about five miles south of the uh soviet madison wisconsin and uh from here we walked over to culver's it's a local you know, Wendy's type place, uh, big or big fast food. And from here to three and a half blocks from there, there's five different uh, signs asking for people to volunteer to be foster parents. They're seeking these people because nobody wants to be because of the what it takes to be a foster parent in Wisconsin in 2024. You have to give up every belief you have. And if this child at some point uh, in its early development says, I'm not sure of my gender, you can't say a damn word about it. You need to seek uh, uh, the social worker out to, to help you in that decision for the child. Um, you can't take the child to church. You can't do anything uh, as a foster parent in Wisconsin. And, you know, they're going to keep the signs up and keep looking. All right, George, what's our next story here? Did you freeze? There you are. <laughs> yeah, for just, just for a second. Right. Um, Justin Welby has been in Jamaica these past three days. Mm -hmm. And there's no surprise because uh, he's on his apology tour. Now, I must say that he uh, does seem to enjoy jet setting and uh, going to these different places and uh, having... Uh, you know, he was in Central America last month, and now he's in Jamaica, and gosh knows where he's going to be next. Um, but he addressed the 200th anniversary of the Diocese of Jamaica's founding, and he, gave, and he apologized for the crimes of his ancestors against the Jamaican's ancestors. And he apologized for the slave trade, and he talked about the 100 million pounds the church commissioners are going to make available and how he would see to it that that money would be managed by people of color. And it was just so cringeworthy because, you know, 
I have to ask myself, does he really believe this nonsense? Does he have such a shallow grasp of history? Uh, the, the claims that the, the Church of England's money was based on slavery have been thoroughly debunked by professional historians. You know, the church commissioners did a little report that uh, sort of put forward this claim hesitantly, but it was shown not to be true. Yet Welby is continuing to preach this falsehood. Never mind the fact that it was the Royal Navy that ended the slave trade. It was Britain who stopped slavery. And slavery was a worldwide institution. Yeah, it was. They and blocked it. Was it. Britain. They, they, they got in the water and blocked slave boats. I mean, they blocked the French and the Spanish yeah. and the Portuguese and the Americans. And on the other side of Africa, they blocked, blocked the uh, uh, Omanis and the Zanzibaris and all the Arabs. Britain, who did this? Yeah. Now, so that, but Justin Welby acts as if this was, you know, Poland and he's a representative of the German people. Yeah. If you are an American and live here in the West, you would assume most of the uh, slaves taken out of North, uh, out of Africa, ended up here in North America, which is untrue. Most of the slaves ended up in the Caribbean and, and other countries. We uh, imported uh, horribly 400,000 uh, uh, slaves from Africa. But if you look at Jamaica and other Caribbean countries, it was like six million. Um, it was it's it's a, a larger proportion, and it, because the Church of England is past its prime uh, and no longer a, a church in any fashion or form and for, in formation, in my humble opinion, I don't care what Welby does down there. If he wants to have his uh, white guilt moment for himself in the church, fine, you know. I think the well, Anglican community is slowly moving on. Yes, but the church in the West Indies is, is in trouble. It's in yeah. trouble. It's yeah. losing members right and left to Pentecostal groups. Um, its primary issue is one of crime and the breakdown of society, youth violence, you know, drugs and money arising from drugs and weapons and all that. And to allow these non-issues that uh, really, you know, the, the problem with the corruption of culture in the West Indies is not a result of slavery 200 years ago mm -hmm. because the culture has crashed in the last 30 or 40 years. They just didn't wake up to learn it recently. Um, there's been a lot of work on it. You can hear uh, Jordan Peterson or Charles Murray people, uh, or uh, Soul, what's his name? Um, uh, the American, uh, well, Thomas Sowell, sure. speak a great more eloquently about this issue than mine, but, you know, colonialism has not caused Africa's poverty. Uh, it's the cultures that have arisen and the, the, the fact that Justin Welby gave up a chance to preach about Jesus Christ and that power to transform the, to transform Jamaica in favor of English money can transform and make Jamaica a better place. Well, you and I, you, you and I were in Kingston, uh, Jamaica, many years ago for an ACC uh, event, and the poverty there is caused by the corruption of the government. Uh, mm -hmm. They have plenty of opportunity to ask for money from other nations, and that money goes into the pockets of the officials. It doesn't go to the people. And that's where the, the poverty exists. They, they have a wonderful um, influx of visitors and tourists through the uh, use of cruise boats uh, that show up at little coastal communities and all these people come ashore and spend their money. Uh, that money doesn't make it to your average Jamaican. That money just uh, goes through corruption. There's a bit of a mafia in uh, Jamaica as well. And... Justin Welby doesn't understand that. He doesn't know how to speak to that. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I remember we would uh, sit in one of the bar restaurants, I think it was the Hilton, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things I noticed, and, you know, because they're down times, is that, you know, the place was packed with prostitutes in mm -hmm. the evening. And the prostitutes would basically pay the maitre d' or the uh, bartenders 
uh, for the privilege or the right or for the space to solicit clients uh, in their restaurants and that uh, those who were not well dressed or those who looked out of place would be tossed out but money changes hands that's that sort of corruption is not just government corruption but corruption across society mm-hmm. that a maitre d you know that a, uh, a maitre d or a host at a restaurant or a, or at a bar uh, basically went, closes his eyes at illegal activity demeaning demoralizing immoral activity for money passing hands if you wanted to buy drugs you knew you know people I didn't want to go down that alley and explore where you can buy drugs because I don't do drugs. But the point is that it's all available. And but the corruption of the society is that basic. And it is Jesus Christ that can end that corruption by having people stop and say, I'm not going to play that game anymore. And that game is the 100 million pounds that listen, I feel guilty. I have nothing to offer except money. All I can offer you in my guilt is money. Uh, my religion won't help me. Won't help you. Won't help me. Uh, my God can't help you. Can't help me. But boy, this money that we have in the treasury of the church, I hope that helps. And you've just provided another source of uh, corruption, George. Yeah, I mean, the, we've said we're going to have uh, people of African extraction manage this money. What well, do you know what that means? Uh, it's going to be stolen and siphoned off by an elite. Uh, the Caribbean has uh, you know, elites. Not everybody is poor. There's some very wealthy people. Uh, but the, And they're going to manage it and basically steal the money. Uh, it's... Oh my. It's... The blindness and the lack, as, as you pointed out, Kevin, it's the lack of faith in anything other than money or power. Um, this really is a Marxist worldview that Justin Welby is is, is purveying. Mm-hmm. That uh, these you know, that class antagonisms and you know, ep, you know class struggles or, the, or what it's about, and we need to basically use other people's money uh, because Justin Welby did give the hundred million pounds that you know, but he has temporary, at least oversight of part of it. He's happy to spend other people's money to buy popularity. No, no, no. To buy forgiveness. He's he's buying forgiveness. And I I don't see anywhere in the New Testament or Old Testament where we are uh, asked to consider buying forgiveness. Don't, yeah. So, all right. That was fun. Uh, Guys, if you hear cars going by and trucks going by and dump trucks going by that's because um this week we decided to get a a campground just outside of town that was inexpensive but happens to be on a major highway and that traffic it's like that at 2 a.m 4 a.m you know but i I thought i'd add a little cultural perspective what it's like to live on a highway at a campground in wisconsin well beyond a okay private eye we don't have one here in uh, the U.S. Um, Private Eye is a uh, uh, magazine-type newspaper display they have in uh, England. Reports that Welby supported John Smythe financially. The Private, Art article, Private Eye article said Welby was one of the evangelical leaders who sent Smythe money in Zimbabwe when he was an exile. But we know that's not true because nobody could find John Smythe in uh, uh, Zimbabwe because he, he just disappeared, George. There's no way you could send him a check. That is a fake story. Well, again, we have no first-hand knowledge. We just are looking at this Private Eye article, which, if true, is horrendous. John Smythe was a serial abuser of young men who were involved with these uh, bash camps, uh, boys' uh, evangelical camps for the upper classes in Britain. And he would sadistically beat any uh, these boys in private retreats he was leading. And when it was discovered, he was basically told, leave the country or you're going to jail. And so he went first to Zimbabwe and later to South Africa. And in Zimbabwe, he started the same sort of camps that he had in England. And he repeated his bad behavior there. Well, Justin, it was, how did Smythe 
fund all this stuff? Well, he got money from his evangelical friends and acquaintances in the UK after he left. So after he left, whenever, when those in the know knew he was a pervert, they sent him money to sort of keep him quiet and get him out of the I, I stated that the, uh, you're breaking up a little. You, you didn't say they held him accountable? And no, he was no. not held accountable. It was just, let's make it go away by having him get out of town. Just in private eyes stated that Justin Welby was one of these evangelicals who sent money to Smythe while Smythe was in Africa. Now, one of the excuses the Church of England has had about, you know, it's been six years since the investigation started into Smythe and nothing's happening. It's, it's pushed back every six months. The can keeps being kicked further down the road. And one of the uh, excuses is, well, we couldn't find Smythe when he was in Zimbabwe and South Africa. Well, that's, you know, nonsense. All they had to do was ask the people who said, or, you know, his buddies, his friends. Maybe he wasn't in the phone book and that's all they looked. They, you know, they, they didn't. There was a little uh, uh, hubbub where... Um, it was claimed that the Church of England told the South African church, warned them about Smythe, and uh, Tabo Makoba, the Archbishop of Cape Town, said nobody told us anything. Um, again, the, the, the basic story that Private Eye had is that after it was known that he was a pervert and had violated, you know, the his office and his as, as a church leader, he was still sent money by people like Justin Welby. I would have sent him money for a plane ticket to come back and fa face prosecution, but, you know, that's just Kevin. Now, let's oh. just pause for a second. Yeah. There's been no denials. There's been no threats of litigation. And Private Eye keeps a libel lawyer uh, on uh, speed dial. Yeah. So it looks like they're just going to let this one float by from at Lambeth Palace. They're neither going to confirm or deny, but just ignore it. Which, just as they've ignored the Smythe case. Yeah. Okay. In political terms, uh, ignorance is not always the worst thing in the world. Uh, I and I want to uh, juxtapose uh, the Episcopal Church versus the AMIA. Okay. The Episcopal Church has largely ignored Anglican TV, Anglican Unscripted, um, over these last 12 years, or longer, over these last 870 episodes. They, they, they know we're here, they know that we accurately report, but they, they don't respond to anything we say, and they don't put out press releases, but we say, um, basically, we're just off in the field, a, a little annoying bug. That's all they think of us. Whereas... AMIA uh, didn't like our reporting and, and uh, pointed all the nuclear weaponry they had, lasers from space, uh, TNT, and tried to completely detonate and remove us from the face of the earth. Um, those are the two different uh, perspectives of how you treat news stories. And I can't say that just ignoring something is the worst thing to do because uh, the other is to draw attention to yourself. Yeah, the Anglican Communion News Service has attacked us pretty regularly. Sure. Uh, when we have a story that upsets the people in uh, London. And part of it is, is because we have that audience that uh, doesn't necessarily believe everything the Anglican Communion News Service says, and we put out something that contradicts what they say. And so they have to swat us down. And, uh, you know, the former ACC Secretary General Josiah Dawu Faron. Uh, you know, has, you know, would attack us with particular vigor and dislike. Well, that only just helped us because, you know, African leaders who saw George and Kevin uh, being vilified, well, what have they got to say? And, oh, well, you know, they're right. Our experience tells us that what they're saying is truthful, mm -hmm. such that when we had the story, the blow up of uh, the adultery case, the former prime of Uganda, the current, uh, uh, the current primate of Uganda communicated with us directly and gave us the information mm -hmm. before I think he gave it to local newspapers. Sure. Because we, sh we had 
basically proven that we were fair and could be trusted. And the Episcopal Church's response has been best to ignore them and not to hit back. And I, because I, if, they, if you start wrestling in the mud, what happens? Yeah, but, Chuck Murphy yeah. Chuck Murphy found that all the things that we reported about him that he hated turned out to be true. And it, it's, it's not good for them. And the yeah. ACNA, ACNS, the Community News Service, we've never been shown to be incorrect. And every time they cause a stink, it just pushes more people in the global south into our uh, audience. And we thank you for that. All right. Now, one thing happens when the world finds that the church doesn't hold its people accountable. they like, well, you're letting perverts and other people run amok in your leadership. And when we find out about it, you don't do anything about it. You're not holding your church accountable. And that's been the blackest eye for the church for 2,000 years, is not holding other uh, bishops and clergy and lay people accountable within its uh, fellowship. And the Texas legislature has made changes to a statute of limitation, may change its statute of limitations on abuse because there is a, a famous pastor in Texas, uh, apparently a friend of Trump, who admitted to a relationship with a young girl many years ago, and he's currently outside that statute of limitations, and Texas is not happy as they should not be. Hey, Robert Morris is, was pastor of Gateway Church, and that's mm -hmm. a Fort Worth area mega church with uh, 25,000 people in attendance on an average Sunday. And they'd have 10 campuses in Texas and Wyoming. So Morris is in one spot in Fort Worth, and they've got it videoed, broadcast to nine other congregations, 25,000 people. And it was, and a woman came forward who said that when she was 12 years old, Morris molested her from the age of 12 to about 16. And this took place 35 years ago. And Morris stepped down and he since has been dropped by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. And he basically has been made persona non, persona non grata in the uh, Protestant evangelical world. Good. But the but the Texas legislature said, well, wait a second, you're basically losing your income, but you have abused a position of trust. And, you know, I don't know, I think it might be seven years or something, statute of limitations. That really can't be right because it, a, a child uh, is not going to be able to speak up or emotionally or physically, whatever. So that the Texas legislature is now re rethinking its statute of limitation laws on sexual abuse of minors and vulnerable people. And part of the thing is that we saw the Catholic Church go through this 10, 15 years ago. And one of the things said at the time was, well, you know, it's Catholics because they're celibate and they're all mm -hmm. closet homosexuals, you know, it's just going to happen to them. It's not so. There's many perverts I guess, proportionately in the Protestant world as in the Catholic world, as there is in the teaching profession. Um, don't know how many school teachers, you read more about school teachers and uh, getting uh, caught up in this stuff. There are more school teachers and ministers, of course, but this is a universal human failing. And I sort of applaud the Texas legislature not to just say this is a Catholic thing, but rather this is a human thing that we really need to work on. And, and there are crimes that should not have limitations. Uh, certainly murder, um, first and second degree manslaughter should have uh, you know, limitations, sexual crimes against children uh, and vulnerable people absolutely should not have limitations. And I would not, I would not be offended if this were taken up at a federal level uh, here in America. Uh, we have some two follow-up strange stories that are happening in the continent of Africa, in the country of one of the, the first stories, Uganda where they have gone ahead and issued copyright claims for their Anglican wear, their Anglican vestments. And uh, I, you know, of all the stories I thought we'd cover today, you know, uh, presidential politics, missing Biden, I did not expect you to introduce the story of uh, copywritten vestments. Uh, give me a little background on this. What's, what's going on? Well, the Church of Uganda filed former copyright notices on the vestments of Anglican clergy. 
uh, with the proper uh, authorities in uh, the Ugandan government. And immediately this has prompted lawsuits. And there's a lawsuit brought by an association of Pentecostal and uh, prosperity preachers saying, hey, you can't claim these vestments as uh, being sole, only allowed to be worn by Anglicans. Uh, it's, it's freedom of speech and freedom of dress and this and that. Well, the problem is that uh, independent ministers and a few charlatans will dress up by the whole uh, bishops of Coutremont, mm -hmm. you know, and drive into town, into a little town, and pretend to be a bishop or and shake people down for money. Or they'll start their ministries and with the prosperity ministry and the gospel ministries, and they steal the young people, impressionable people from the Anglican and the Catholic churches, and now they're stealing their vestments. And the Anglican church in uh, Uganda is saying, look, we've got to start putting down some boundaries here. Uh, we don't share your theology, but so don't steal our distinctive way of dressing. Um, now, it's sort of a funny little thing of fighting over who gets to wear a, a Canterbury cap on Sunday in church. Uh, but uh, there is a threat to the established mainline churches in Africa from Pentecostalism and the prosperity gospel. Uh, prosperity gospel more so in Nigeria, but Pentecostalism in uh, Uganda. And this is something that you see in South America where the uh, Catholic Church has lost tens of millions of members to Pentecostalism. Um, and so the Anglican Church is trying little tiny steps uh to maintain some of the footholds and things that they have well we're, we're trying to stop the imposters and in this day and age where i you can't tell if a woman is not a man and a man is not a woman because of imposterism and i mean it is crazy uh, especially here in places like uh you got to so, George, I, I have a story to tell you that I probably haven't told you before. But if you remember correctly, uh, you and I were stationed on assignment in Tanzania for the primates meeting at the White Sands Resort on the uh, east coast of uh, uh, Africa. And one of the day trips you could take at this meeting, if you wanted to, I, don't, I, I may have been the only person who did it, you could drive up and see the David Livingston compound where he ministered to the people of Tanzania. And I said, hey, that'd be fun to do. I'll take my camera up and uh, go buy some uh, gifts for the kids and whatever. So I hired a driver and he picked me up at the, the compound uh, where the bishops and the press and everybody was. And as far as he was concerned, he thought he was picking up a bishop. I wasn't wearing purple. I was wearing my, my standard uh, black polo shirt. Um, and I did, that's right, <laughs> I did not know that uh, um, he thought I was a bishop. I thought I had communicated fully that I am Kevin from America and that I am press. So as we're driving up, he's having a wonderful conversation and we get up to the, the David Livingston uh, compound area and he says, just a minute, uh, the, you know, I, and he went into the church uh, there and came out and the priest came out and said, Bishop, welcome to, <laughs> to uh, whatever it was called, whatever church it was. And I'm like, the jaw is drawn. <laughs> I'm like, how do I get out of this one? Well, uh, yeah, they all speak Swahili. There's not a lot of people who speak really good English. So um, I spent a, a good eight to ten minutes explaining. I am a reporter. I'm at the primates meeting. Um, and I'm not a bishop, and it didn't go well for the driver, who was actually doing this so he'd get a, be get a better parking spot next to the church. Um, and it, over there in um, uh, the eastern side of Africa, they, they don't really have the faces and the pictures to put with the, who the bishops are in their local community. They really don't know who's who until they show up in town or in, into the village. Uh, on their bicycles or cars. Um, they had no idea who I was. And uh, I could have come off as a bishop if I were so inclined to to burn forever. But I didn't want to. So, um, you know, I, it, it's one of those things, George, that uh, 
uh, I hope that they can maintain and retain uh, some type of copyright on investments. It's sad that we have to enter into a world where that needs to happen. But that's not the only strange story we have from uh, the east side of Africa. Now we're going to the middle of Africa. War against Christians in eastern Congo is heating up. It's heating up, but it's been hot for a long, long time. Yeah. On Sunday, three Anglicans were murdered when uh, jihadists, members of uh, one of these uh, Muslim militias, stormed into a church in the eastern Congo, shot it up, and three people were killed. Um, sadly, death and violence in the Congo against Christians by Islamists is a story on par with corruption in India or persecution in Nigeria. We could do it every single week, and mm -hmm. the story is essentially the same. Different persons, same story. Uh, the Congo is is the best. It is just horrendous right now. Uh, rival militias, some backed by different nations: Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Islamist groups, go groups allied with the uh, government in Kinshasa. There are even UN forces that have sort of become another militia and the people suffering are local people villages destroyed people uh, forced to flee and you know we, the amount of energy that we the world expends on gaza uh, for instance compared to the real crises in the sudan uh, in the congo and other places where there are tens of thousands every day being of uh, well it's always a mistake, I think, to compare apples to oranges, yeah. but we need to realize there's more than one crisis in this world of war. There's not just one war in the Ukraine and one in Gaza, and that's it. There are wars everywhere where people are dying every day. There's a war in Russia. The, war. World, doesn't love, the yeah. world doesn't seem to care. I think one of the u unique things we don't understand in Western culture is this is the age of the martyr. More people are being murdered for their faith now than ever before in history. And, uh, you know, certainly there's places in, in the Middle East and stuff that are slowly coming to Christ. But in other continents, the war continues. And it's a war uh, based on power, corruption, and uh, an infighting between Islam and Christianity. And it's sad to watch. Um, and we will continue to report it here because you need to be made aware of it so you can pray for it. George, let's go back to politics. Who do you think uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris should pick for VP? Gosh, there's so many things being floated about these days. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor of Pennsylvania has been touted as someone who could appeal to the blue collar Midwest because for Harris to win, she must take Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and, and hopefully Ohio. But the governor of Pennsylvania is Jewish, and that would alienate the uh, hard left that backs Harris. Yeah. The governor of Michigan, uh, who I personally think is a dreadful woman, uh, oh, she's has said she's not, uh, she's not interested. Mm -hmm. And... And the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has said he's not interested. Mark Kelly, the uh, former astronaut senator from Arizona, has been pushed by center of the road people saying somebody to balance Kamala Harris. But I think at the end of the day, uh, a vice presidential candidate only can hurt the ticket. It can't help the ticket. Um, oh, I have the perfect one. Who's that? Yeah. Megan Markles. <laughs> Megan Markle. <laughs> I can't think of anybody better uh, to compliment the hard work and um, uh, expertise of uh, Kamala Harris than uh, Megan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, as as Kamala Harris comes closer into uh, focus, mm -hmm. I think uh, many of our overseas viewers will not uh, sort of have heard this stuff before she's notorious kamala harris is notorious for what we call word salad statements she that. makes these <laughs> phrases that sound vaguely oprah winfrey-ish uh, along with these hand gestures 
Now, there's been people writing about this for some time in the United States, but it really hasn't uh, been that well distributed because nobody really cares about Kamal Harris. She's not a very good campaigner. She's not a very good politician. But she has this little phrase about what can be and what can be undone and what can be this and what can be that. And it sounds esoteric and new agey. And she has these hand gestures with uh, the right hand going up as she makes it and the left hand going down. Well, people love to point out that this is uh, part of uh, uh, critical race theory, queer theory, that we're, and the uh, gestures uh, mimic the statue of Baphomet, you know, the, uh, 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 the uh, Freemasonry God or whatever. So you're going to see a lot of people talking about uh, Harris's links to the esoteric movement, the cults, critical race theory. And I have to say, my personal take is she's just repeating stuff. She's her. Uh, yeah, I, she does. I, I don't really, I don't really think we need to go that deep into Kamala I, Harris. Yeah, I don't think she has the IQ to really to understand. Uh, race theory and stuff like that and she's she's a repeater um it, sadly and i really i don't want to see politics this divided but uh, i have like 3500 followers and friends on facebook and i my greatest fear is that sometime in mid-october half of my followers are going to be uh, uh touting how horrible the felon is and the other uh, ones are going to be touting how horrible the slut is. And I mean, I, I, and I, I don't want politics to devolve into that. I want us to talk about the issues, not just talk about the people. And if you have the best sense of your political I identity and you can discuss and win uh, the political argument, you will have my vote, regardless of your party. Um, mm -hmm. And so. I mean, Margaret Thatcher was famous of saying that we win the argument first, the office later, and uh, that has to. We have to reapply that here in American politics. Yeah. Well, and there are some conservatives who are very displeased with the Republican ticket because mm -hmm. uh, Trump is uh, basically abortion is not his issue. That's not his thing. He ha is very happy. It's now at the state level. And J.D. Vance, who as an adult converted from atheism to Catholicism, and I saw a lot of, you know, these Catholic bloggers going, oh, looky, looky, he's looky. He's one of us. He's one of us. He's, he's one of us, but he's happy to uh, yeah. pick up the Donald Trump of uh, indifference. Mm -hmm. So so that even though Vance is a Catholic, he is uh, not a particularly uh, aggressive one well, this in is his... This is no longer this is no longer Ronald Reagan's GOP. Okay, th this is uh, Trump's GOP, and they have different ideas of what conservatism means. For us, as young Reagan Republicans, there was higher moral value in some issues than there are now. There is no moral value in abortion. That that's been wiped out from the platform. There is very little moral valuation in heterosexual marriage that, that that's white, white from the platform and so um, where do people like myself a orthodox anglican evangelical uh find political representation you know I, <laughs> november will be interesting to say the least george to say the least well it it is exciting times we're going to live in and mm -hmm. and uh, by the time this goes to broadcast, Kevin, everything might be different. Uh, there <laughs> might be a new candidate. Uh, there might yeah. be another assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be, you know, uh, it's been there are legal challenges going to be mounted mounted to Kamala Harris because mm -hmm. neither of her parents were U.S. citizens when she was born, mm -hmm. and that should, even though she was born in the United States, that still, you know may disqualify her from running for president if the lawyers get into it who knows I know. if we could have obama we can have anybody i'm kevin colson and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 871 of anglican on screen